All right, well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to church. We're glad you're with us in your living room. Wherever you are, would you just stand with us? We're going to worship the Lord together. to see everybody. Welcome to the living room again. You may have noticed we were all standing up. We were trying to figure out this living room thing just like you are, and we wanted to make sure you all knew um, that really what we want you to be in your living room is free. So we kind of started the first few weeks like sitting down, 
Uh, but man, last week at Easter service, we were all talking about it after, and we wanted to stand. We wanted to stand and sing. So we want to make sure that you guys in your living rooms are feeling the freedom of, to find that posture of worship before God. I don't know about you, but this is how my weeks are going. They've always gone this way. But certainly right now with all this digital technology going on, it's kind of like your phone. You know, if you, you use your phone for a long time, eventually uh, it starts running slower and it has all these issues. And what do you do to fix it? Well, you, you, you go to factory reset. You have to reset your phone to its original setting so that it, it works again. And there's a sense in which God has given us Sunday morning worship, this coming together as his community for Sabbath rest to reset our minds to the original pillars of the creator's heart. So that's what we came to do this morning. And by the way, we also know that you've got your kids with you in your living rooms. We want to say hi to all the kids out there. Great to see you. We hope that um, this thing's been fun for you in some way. Uh, we know that you've been doing virtual school and all that kind of stuff. Uh, we want you all to know that a great thing for you to be doing right now is learning how to worship together as a family in the living room. And uh, we really think that that's also going to translate to when we all come back together, which we look forward to. What I want to do is remind you that we have some amazing tools that our children and family ministry have put together for you uh, to worship with your kids as you figure all that out. And everybody kind of in their own home with their own kids needs to figure out how best to worship together. So I'm literally going to pick up my computer right now and just let you know what you can do uh, to be uh, worshiping with your kids. So if you go to our homepage, you can do this every Sunday before the service starts or after, uh, but you go to virtual meetings, which is one of the first, uh, one of the four buttons right there on the screen, and uh, it'll take you to a page, uh, a site that'll have our adult worship page that talks about going onto Facebook or YouTube or the website to watch our service. But then if you scroll down, it says children's worship, and you hit the website there, and that's going to pull up two different uh, little buttons you can hit, Rio Littles and Rio Kids. Uh, just for uh, example's sake, I'm going to hit Rio Littles. And it's going to pull up a little introductory video from Liz Lacey, our Rio Littles director. And then it's got a video lesson on there. So depending on where your kids are at, you can have them stay with you for the music and then send them uh, to watch that on their own. Or you can... Uh, do it with them after the service or before, but we just wanted you to know that this is here and also you really need to browse around because uh, the children's ministry is making all kinds of resources for you to work with your kids throughout the week, to do your personal worship with them throughout the week. So take advantage of that and um, we, uh, we think that you're really gonna have a rich time together learning better and better how to worship as a family in your living room so that when we come back to this living room, we are all able to worship God together. We're excited about that. Another thing I wanted to remind you about is that Alpha started this week. Super excited, had some great groups. The Zoom call thing really seemed to work. In fact, in some ways, maybe better. I think maybe people who have a lot of questions, who that's really for, uh, who Alpha is really for, they felt maybe a little safer that they were sitting in their own living room. The group that I was in, just unbelievable how quick everybody really opened up with some really deep personal stuff. So you can invite anybody to that any week. It, it, it doesn't, uh, you don't have to do it in sequence, so you can invite them this week or next. And uh, you should see a link on your screen to go to our website and do that. Or it's all over our social media. It's just a Zoom call with a Zoom ID that you can call into. So we want you to take advantage of that as well. So, with all that in mind, we hope you're doing great. We want to tell you that we had the most awesome Easter. We think that we might have had like a third more people than have ever, ever attended worship with us last week. And it was just so beautiful. And we got responses from literally all over the country, upstate New York and all kinds of other places, saying that they worship with us. That's been happening all over the world. There's something really special going on right now, even in the midst of what we know is struggle for a lot of people. Uh, we believe God's bringing us together. And so let's continue to worship today. And we, uh, we love you wherever you're at. Let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, I think about this virtual world in which we're living. In reality, we've been living in this for a long time. You're sitting at the right hand of the Father. In spirit and in truth, we worship you. And yet, your Holy Spirit, though we do not see him standing before us, is dwelling in us right now. And that means that that scripture that says where, when two or three are gathered, you're with us. It means you're with us now, all over the world. We bask in that. And we worship you. We pray that right now, your spirit would reset 
to those original settings that we might love what you love and worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Just take a minute and the quiet here, just take a second to quiet your heart and continue on in an attitude of prayer. Salvation 
praise you that you are one who does the impossible. You say what is impossible with man is possible with God. And so Lord, we just cling to that very simple truth that you are eternal and we are not. That you are all-knowing and we are not. Oftentimes we chomp at that rain. We refuse to be corrected. We refuse to receive direction from any other than ourselves. And so we don't understand it, God, when things don't turn out the way we expect it. But faith is not about seeing. It's about the assurance of things unseen. It's declaring in faith the truths of God. And today, God, we rest in the promise that you are good, that your mercies are new every day, that your loving kindness toward your people knows no limits. And so in even the virus and the crazy things that are going on, some of us are facing hard times, God. You meet each one of us where we're at and you say, I'm with you. Heavenly Father and I'm looking after you and though it may not look like what you expect in the end this is what will bring you glory O oh God and produce the greatest fruit in our lives and so in faith we pray God prune away Lord painful though it may be God would you chip away at our idols Increase our faith today, we pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Well, this time you're going to see on your screen a link to ways to give. And, you know, we've said often in the service that we intentionally include our offering as a part of our worship service and not as some sort of tag on to it. And so even though you may have like an automatic debit thing or you may give during the week or whatever your rhythm may be, I want to encourage you every week when we have this time of offering, if you haven't given your tithes, your offerings, do that now. If you have already, then I want to encourage you just to quiet your heart and pray over that offering. You know, I, I like to take the offering in my hands uh, when I'm in the seats and uh, hold the offering into my hand and look at it and say, God, do with it as you will. It's not mine to begin with. I'm merely a steward. And so, Lord, have your way. And we realize some of you are not able at this time to give. We want to encourage you to reach out to our help page. But if you can give, then give. And not only just giving, but give as an act of worship. And we're going to give you a minute right now to do that. Father, we give you thanks once again for the ways you've sustained us. And though some of us are in the midst of a storm right now, God, we can declare with full confidence that you see us, you know us, and you look after us as a good father. And so, Lord, in the obedience of faith, God, we surrender to you that which is chief among our idols, and that is our material things.
God, would you do with it as you will? And not only what you will with the money or the gifts itself, but God, would you use it to shape in us Christ's character? We forsook it all. Or we count all of the other things than you loss. We might know you and walk with you today. So we give you thanks for this time of worship. We pray you'd receive it in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Man, Waymaker, it is great again to be in the living room with you guys and, um, and in all of your living rooms uh, out there. Man, I, I just, I'm, I'm compelled to say something to you guys um, about that Waymaker thing. Um, there was this great post in my next door uh, app this week. Uh, a woman basically wrote a post that said, we're all in the same storm, but we're not all in the same boat. You know, it means, this thing means different things to different people, depending on our life situation, our resources. Um, but I want to tell you something that um, there really is a Waymaker in that storm, no matter what boat you're in. And I want to tell you right now, if you're a dad sitting in that living room, you're the pastor to your family. You're, you're the pastor to your kids that are looking to you. My dad, when I was little, ugh, I loved him so much and, um, and still do. He went home to be with the Lord. But man, um, I literally sometimes wondered if he was God. I really did. And I grew up to realize that he had flaws and he was human. But man... Um, uh, shepherd that family of yours and know that there's a way maker with you. But if you're that mom, if you're that single mom sitting there, uh, man, he's with you too. He's with you too. Whatever you are, whether you've still got your job or whether you lost your job, whatever you are, wherever you are, Jesus will be with you in that boat. And we talk about that entering into a new series uh, this week. Uh, we're super excited about it. You know that we've been in a 40 days of prayer time during Lent where every day uh, at 11.09, we would get a little push uh, to pray on that day for that moment. And, uh, and a part of the reason that we did that along with uh, just needing to do that is that we really want to become a house of prayer at Rio. And let me tell you where that begins. That house of prayer begins in the house that is my own heart. It, it begins by coming to that Father, not once for an hour on Sundays, but every moment of every day to reset to those original settings. But it's something else. It's access to that Father. Do you understand this? The greatest gift my Father gave me was access. And any time I wanted to, when I wanted to just be with him to enjoy him, when I wanted to be with him to hear his stories or, or to ask him questions for his wisdom or to, or to plead with him about something or, or to tell him that something terrible happened or to confess something, he gave me access. And I watched other people in his world because uh, uh, he had a, a, a lot of things that he led uh, trying to get access, having limited access, thinking they couldn't get access. What a terrible place that would have been. Here's what's amazing about your infinite father. Ready access all the time. The only thing that comes between God and me is me. So we enter into a series this week and one of the most beautiful things God has done to teach us how to pray is he himself has prayed in our presence. So for the next four weeks, we're gonna enter into a series called When God Prays. And we're gonna look not only at how God teaches us to pray, but how God through Jesus prayed himself. Today, we visit the story of a desperate father. Let's hear it. And when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and scribes arguing with them. And immediately the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. And he asks them, what are you arguing about? And someone from the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I ask your disciples to cast it out. And they were not able and he answered to them, oh, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And when they brought the boy to him, 
And when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy. And he fell on the ground and rolled about and foamed at the mouth. And Jesus said to his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And, and, it's, and it's often cast him into a fire or into water to destroy him. But, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if I can, all things are possible for the one who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, I believe. Help me in my unbelief. And when Jesus saw the crowd running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit and he said to it, you mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter into him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out. And the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. Well, good morning. I confess that is uh, kind of an odd story. Uh, you know, that sounds strange to our 21st century American ears in particular. I mean, it's not, you know, part of our day-to-day -day experience, at least to knowingly deal with people who are demonically possessed. But, uh, but I confess as well that pretty much as long as I have known of that story, and it has been most of my life anyway, uh, I've been able to totally relate to that story. And I'm going to tell you why, because I can relate to the people in the story. You know, I can relate to this dad in the story, and not because I've ever had or I presently have demonically possessed kids. That's, that's not the point of connection for me, but the point of connection for me is the fact that I get his desperation. Like, I mean, this guy is up against an impossible, at least for him, situation, and it means everything to him. It's, it's his son. And you kind of get the impression as you read the story and you feel and hear the desperation of this dad that this dad has tried anything and everything that's come across his path. Like this guy is willing to do anything to fix this problem that he himself cannot fix. And thus far, absolutely nothing has worked. And thus far, by the way, includes even the intervention of Jesus' disciples. And that's a significant statement because prior to this story, Jesus had empowered his disciples to go out, to heal the sick, wait for it, you ready, to raise the dead and to cast out demons. And that's what they've done. Like they've just split up into groups and they went all over the region of Galilee where this story takes place and they've gone to towns and they've gone to villages and they have mastered the demonic forces of this world and everybody knows it, including this dad. So like the disciples of Jesus and Jesus himself roll into town, Jesus takes three, they go somewhere else, he leaves nine behind. How many are needed? Oh, in their mind, just one. So dad hears this, and he dares to believe again. And I say it that way really intentionally, because when your hopes are dashed again and again and again and again and again and again, it takes courage, guys, to put yourself out there again. In fact, I think every time your hope is dashed, it takes a greater level of courage to try again, to believe again, and then they're dashed again, and then it takes a greater level, and then it, they're dashed again, and it takes a greater level. And every time that your hopes are blown up and it doesn't work, whatever it is that you've tried, you are more devastated than you were the last time something failed. And the reason is because you understand, like there's a list of options out there that might work for your problem that means everything to you. And every time something doesn't work, you scratch one thing off the list, and you don't know how long the list is. But you know at least two things. One, the list has either gotten shorter or, two, that was the last thing on the list. And in either case, it's despairing. Like, I get this dad. Jesus comes upon this scene in which his disciples have failed. They're arguing with the religious leaders who are always contending with them, it seems. There's a big crowd of people there because, you know, they didn't have Netflix. So this is like the only entertainment in town. And he walks up and he goes, what's going on? And the devastated dad steps up to explain the situation. 
And all this dad can muster at this point is this. He basically just says, you know, if you can do anything. And I love Jesus' response. You heard it, but I'll read it again. Verse 23, Jesus said to him, if, if you can do anything, like, like you're doubting me in this? All right, I want to step out of their story for a second, and I want to step into mine and yours. What's the answer to that question? I mean, like, if you're really honest, look, the answer to that question is, okay, Lord, well, at least occasionally, yes, right, yes, I, I, I'm, I'm doubting you in this. And, and maybe, you know, Jesus, it isn't so much that I doubt that you can. Like, can's a bad word. Let's replace the word can with the word will. Because that's what I doubt. It's not that I doubt that you can do it. It's I doubt that you will do it. And the reason I doubt that you will do it is because I've asked you to, to do it. <laughs> you know? Like, I don't... I don't believe necessarily that you will do it. It's certainly not when I want you to do it because you haven't done that yet and certainly not how I want you to do it because you haven't done that yet and certainly not according to my specifications because, look, this isn't the first time we've had this conversation. Like, it's not can, it's will. But the answer is yes. And not just for us, but for this dad. And yet what I don't want you to miss, because I think if you miss this, we miss the whole thing, is what Jesus says next, because what he says next is powerful. Jesus says to this man, if if you can, and then he says all things, which by the way, by which he means all things, are possible for who? For the one who believes. And then here comes the desperate dad. Immediately, like he sees a glimmer of hope, just a little bit of light. He dares to believe again. And he says, oh, 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 Lord, if that's the problem, then I believe, I believe, you know. And then he gets real honest, doesn't he? Because all the doubts come rushing in and he's thinking to himself, do I believe? Do I just want to believe? If I say that I believe, will it? And he says, help my unbelief. Look, I'm going to be honest. I totally relate to that dad. He's my buddy. He's a longtime friend. But I can relate to the disciples too because they too are facing an impossible situation, but they didn't know that it was an impossible situation. Like everything had led them to believe that they were walking into something they could totally deal with. They had cast out demons. And look, there were nine of them. Like one of them should have been able to handle this. Nine for sure are going to be able to handle this. So dad brings the son out because he's going, hey, you guys have mastery over the demonic world. And they're like, you are correct about that. Gather up the audience. You don't have Netflix. You might as well show up. Here come the religious leaders. Good. This is an opportunity for us to best them because I'm sure he's taken them, him, the boy to them already. And they've obviously failed. And they do what they've always done. Different results. Imagine their confusion. Imagine their frustration. Frankly, just imagine their humiliation. Like they stepped in with confidence because they knew they got this thing. Man, this is going to happen. This is no big deal. And it doesn't happen. I, I, I can relate to that. I, I know what it's like to, to having done things and, and feeling like you've got it. And of course, it's going to go this way. And obviously, this is going to happen. And I'm certainly prepared for this. And I've done this thing before. And I show up and I'm like, yes, let's do this thing. And then it doesn't happen. Confusion, frustration, humiliation. Yeah, they're my friends too. You know, honestly, as I look at the story, I can even relate to the demonically possessed boy, and not because I was ever a demonically possessed boy. Though I will tell you that my parents watch this every week, and right now they're looking at each other going, eh, you know, because, I mean, it was borderline, perhaps. But here's how I can relate to this kid. I, I can relate to this boy because I know what it is to have things in me that I can't cast out. Selfishness that I can't seem to master, that I can't, can't get rid of, compulsions that I can't stop, feelings that I can't quit, thoughts that I can't, like, where did that come from? Why would I ever think something like that? What in the world is going on here? You get the idea? Ideas, behaviors, thoughts, feelings, all of these things that I, in my own strength, well, let's say it, it's impossible for me. I've run up against my limitations even with me. And look, so I look at this odd-sounding story, and I totally relate to the story, and I'm just going to say it too. I, I think that you do as well. 
And I say that because all of us, no matter who you are, are up against some impossible thing. Are you not? I mean, there's an impossible thing for you personally right now. And maybe it's a physical problem. Maybe it's an emotional problem. Maybe it's a spiritual problem. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's some kind of a behavior, some kind of compulsion, some kind of disorder that you have no mastery of, but instead that has absolute mastery over you if you're going to be honest about it. Maybe it's financial problems. Maybe it's your marriage or a relationship. It's, it's something that you can't control even though you've tried, and you've tried in ways that have worked for other people at other times, maybe that have even worked for you in the past, but at this point, they're not working. It's impossible. Now, I'm going to state the obvious, okay? COVID-19, yeah, it's impossible. <laughs> I mean, let's just look at that, because as a city, as a nation, as a world, as individuals, as families, as people, like, we're up against it, man. And look, we're doing everything we can to mitigate it. We're doing everything we can to slow it down. I and mean, we do everything we know to do. We're following all the experts, I hope. We're doing all that we can, but raise your hand if you can just make it stop. Like right now, you can just reach up and just turn off the switch. Just, just do it, because here's the deal. If your hand is up, it's because you were going, oh, and then I said that. Okay, that's it. None of us can fix this. It's impossible, but I want to go one step further. I want to say that we as individuals, that we as Rio Vista Community Church, that we as a part of the greater church, that the greater church itself lacks a spiritual vitality that our preaching cannot and has not fixed, that our teaching cannot and has not fixed, that all of our singing cannot and has not fixed, that our resources cannot and has not fixed, that, that our programs cannot and has not fixed. But here's what we can do, and it's the whole point of the story. We can take what is impossible to us to Jesus, and then in faith, we can lay them at his feet in prayer and ask him to do the impossible for us because that is exactly what he's calling us to do. I mean, if you just continue through that story, what happens? Jesus delivers this boy. He does. It's awesome. And then he and his disciples leave the scene and they go to some house that they're staying in on all likelihood and, and they go inside and they're in private now. And so the disciples who are confused and they're frustrated and they're totally humiliated pull Jesus aside in private and they're like, hey, you know, Lord, um, what happened? You know, we had this. This was in our wheelhouse. Like, we've done this before. Like, what went wrong? And there's more than one version of this story. And when you put them both together, you get a fuller feel for it because Matthew in his version of this story, tells us that Jesus first talks about faith. Matthew 17, verse 20, Jesus said to them, well, it, guys, it was because of your little faith. And you're like, well, how little was their faith? Well, <laughs> they were wondering the same thing, so he cleared it up. He says, for truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you're thinking, well, I mean, these are the disciples, so a mustard seed must be like this. No, 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 a mustard seed is like this. It was the smallest known seed in the agricultural world of Jesus' day. He's like, your faith was not even this big. But if it's this big, what is its power? He says, I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it might actually move. I mean, you know, occasionally that happens. I don't know what the heck. You know, run it up the pole and see if it works. It's not what he says. He says, and it will move. And then he continues and says, and nothing will be what? Because it's our word for the day if you haven't figured it out yet. Nothing will be impossible for you, which for me at least is another connection point. And I say that because when I come up against those things that are impossible for me, I mean, it feels like I'm standing at the foot of a mountain and I'm, I'm standing there with my shovel and my pickaxe and my wheelbarrow, you know, and I'm looking at the mountain and my task is, hey, Tom, move it from here to there. And here's what I want to do. I just want to lie down on the ground in defeat. Like, that's ridiculous. Hey, anybody need a wheelbarrow? Just take it. You know, like, I, this shovel is of no use to me. Free pickaxe. Like, I'm done. I'm out. And Jesus is like, no, no, no. Don't fall to the ground in despair. Kneel on the ground in prayer and bring the mountain that you cannot move and bring it to me. He talks about faith in Matthew. He talks about it too in Mark, but then he ends with prayer. 
Again, the disciples go, what happened? You know, and in verse 29, as you heard, Jesus said to them, this kind, meaning this kind of demon that you were dealing with in this particular instance is different from the kind that you have cast out in the past. He's like, no, 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 it needs a greater power. It needs the power of God. And how is that accessed exactly? He says, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. And you say, all right, so like, what exactly is Jesus saying? Okay, so let me be super clear. Jesus is coming to me and he's coming to you and he's connecting. Here we go, you ready? He's saying, hey, you know what? There are gonna be things in your life yeah, that you can't handle, like they are impossible for you. And it's going to feel like you're standing at the foot of a mountain with your pickaxe and shovel and wheelbarrow, you know, and with the task of moving it from here to there, which you cannot do. And when you're faced with that, what are you going to want to do? Just give all your equipment away, lay down on the ground and defeat because it's over. And he's like, no, I move mountains. This is what I do. I make them, I move them. Kneel. Pray, take your mountain and give it to me. And you say, all right, you know, okay, I hear that. But, I mean, just to rewind a little bit, like, it's not Jesus that I don't think you can do this. It is Jesus that, I, you know, I'm not entirely convinced that you will do this. And, and the reason I'm not entirely convinced is because I've asked you to do this a hundred times or so, and you've not done this, and I'm honestly kind of disappointed, and I don't want to, you know, mess it up even further. Like, maybe it would be better if I didn't do this, if I didn't even ask. But is not Jesus encouraging us to ask? Is he not jumping up and down and going, hey, move mountains, that's my job. Bring mountains to me, that's your job. Do it in faith, expecting me to move it again. Your job and the gift of my spirit. He's saying that. But I do think we need to acknowledge he doesn't always do it how we want him to do it. He doesn't always do it when we want him to do it. And sometimes he says no because he's a loving father. I mean, I think of the Apostle Paul. You know, he famously talks about this thorn in the flesh. And we don't know what the thorn in the flesh is. And frankly, it's good that we don't. Because then we can take whatever affliction we have and we can relate to what he's saying. And we know that it afflicted him big time. We know that he agonized in prayer before the Lord. He tells us that he brought it to the Lord pleading. You can feel his desperation. It's kind of like this dad pleading that God would remove this thorn from him, whatever it was. And what was God's answer to him? It was no. But it's not just no and that's it. It was, no, 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 Paul, I'm not going to do it because I am your loving Heavenly Father and I have something for you of higher and greater and more eternal value than the comfort that you would gain if I took this mountain and moved it from here to there, which I could do. I want you to learn and then I want you to teach for as long as there is a church that my grace is sufficient for you and your weakness. And what does Paul do in that? Because here's what he doesn't do. Like, he might have done this in part. It seems like he's worked it through, and now he writes, you know. So in the working, it might have gotten ugly. But here's where he lands. He embraces the reality of that. And he says, Lord, you know what you have for me, and this is good, and I am going to trust you in it because I know your heart. And even though I can't understand or feel how greater value from this than relief from that, like he works it through until he lands at the greater value and he gets to a place where he says, guys, let me tell you now what I do with my thorns. Let me tell you what I do with my weaknesses. Let me tell you what I do with my mountains that the Lord decides not to move. I embrace them. I rejoice in them. I look forward to them because in them I experience the power of Christ in ways that I never otherwise would. And through me... People get to see Jesus. It's powerful. So with that in mind, what is your mountain? Like, that's the easy one, isn't it? Like, as soon as I started talking about mountains and we all have mountains, you know, you're like, oh, yeah, <laughs> I know what that is. It's, it's this, you know, and it's like, and, you know, and you're at the foot of it, and it's like, move it from here to there, and you're like, nah, I'm out, you know, and then what is Jesus saying? He's like, no, 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 don't lie down in despair and defeat. Kneel down and give me your mountain and do it believing that I'm a mountain-moving Jesus. That I've placed it in your life. Bring to me your expectant prayer. In fact, I think that until God comes to us like he did for Paul and said no, we should just keep asking. Seems to me that's part of the teaching of Jesus on prayer too. 
So what is your mountain? But then beyond that, I mean, if you don't stop there, what else is Jesus saying? He's saying, all right, so this virus, COVID-19, you bringing that to me? Because I'm pretty clear that, you know, you guys, like, you can't move this. It's got to go from here to here, and uh, yeah, no, that's, that's not, not all of you together can stop this thing. Like, bring this to me, and beyond that, Bring to me your own personal spiritual vitality. Bring to me your, the vitality, spiritually speaking, of this church. Bring to me the vitality, spiritually speaking, of the church worldwide in this particular moment, which, by the way, is going to require Jesus to deliver us from a different kind of virus, not a physical one. We need to pray for that, but a spiritual virus. And here's the symptom of that virus. Like if you're sitting there going, I don't know, do I have this virus? Here it is. It's very simple. You're satisfied with your spiritual life. You're kind of happy with the status quo, and you're happy with it because it does for you what you want it to do for you. You know, like, for example, it gives you some measure of peace and the idea in the face of death, and we do have to think about that from time to time. It's inevitable. It's there for you when you need it, like it gives you somebody to hang on to or someone to talk to, like, and, and that's helpful. It doesn't ask too much of you because, as we all do, we manage it. We make sure that it doesn't ask anything uncomfortable of us that we haven't planned for, that we're not already, well, frankly, comfortable with. It's kind of like God begins to approach us, and we're like, we're like, whoa, 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 hey, 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 stop, stop right there. Just, no, 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 stop, no, back up, three steps. No, no, that's two. Back up three, okay, sit. Okay, stay. Like he's a dog. Like he's our pet. Do you know how much spiritual vitality that kind of a spiritual life has? None. It's why we're empty. It's why we're empty of the joy of the Lord. It's why we're empty of the peace of the Lord. It's why we're empty of the presence of the Lord. It's why we're empty of the Lord, of his power, of his strength, of his wisdom, of his might, of the the knowing and the knowledge and the sounding of his voice. And look, we can't fix it, but we can ask him to fix it. And it seems to me that's the kind of prayer he wants to answer. You know, one of the things I've been doing for the last couple of months is I've been reading about revival, and it has been both inspiring and (laughs) semi-discouraging. I said to Beth last night, I'm like, you know, she's like, this is so great. It inspires your faith. I'm like, yes, it inspires my faith. But like, I've gotten to the place now where I've read about so many different revivals that if I don't see God move like this, I'm not sure I can handle the disappointment. I want that for me. I want that for us. I want that for the whole world. Like, I want that for the church. God has again and again and again and again and again and again. You'd be stunned how many times moved in revival in such a way as to just change people and change cities and change nations. It's stunning. Let me give you some of the marks of revival. Just a few. It's a long list. I'm going to give you some. And I do it because I want you to look at, at you, and I want you to look at us, and I want you to look at the greater us, which is the church, and go, oh, hell, I either have that or I don't. We either have it or we don't. And what I want to do is inspire a hunger in you for it. Look, revival looks like repentance. Not I'm a lowly, cruddy pile of dirt, and I feel guilty, and I don't know. No. Revival happens when God falls upon a people. When You might not be able to see him, smell him, hear him, taste him, touch him in that kind of way with your five physical senses, but when you understand you are standing in the very presence of the living God, and you get a grasp with your heart of his beauty, and of his power, and of his perfections, and of his righteousness, of all of his holiness, of all of his glory, like you just begin to take it in. And do you know what happens? Every single time that happens all over the world in all these different ages and in all these different nations and in all these different cultures, repentance. Like on your face before the Lord, repentance. Everybody in the room down. Grieving over our brokenness, not in an unhealthy way, but in a way that calls us to take our brokenness to the one who alone can heal us. You want to talk about a mountain? That's, that's the biggest one we've got. Okay, here's my failure. I, yeah, I can't undo that. I'm just going to sell my shovel. I'm out. Like, laying down. It's over. No, it's not over. There's one who moves mountains. He moves that one for sure. 
Another element of revival is just a passionate love for Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is the mountain mover. He's the one who comes to us in our grief and in our brokenness, who heals us, who forgives us, who makes us new, who makes us clean, who takes all of our failures even and turns them around and then uses them for good, redeems them by bringing more good out of them than the evil they brought initially. It's remarkable. Like revivals are marked by joy, revivals are marked by passionate, all-in, enthusiastic worship where you don't care what anybody else thinks. Like, that's what happens. It's marked by generosity. Why? Because you have the treasure of Christ. You're like, there's no greater treasure. There's no greater safety. There's no greater comfort or security. There's no greater significance or identity. I have it all in Jesus, and therefore I can use this stuff the way that he directs me to do. People in revival lose track of time. You see it again and again. It's remarkable. Like they show up at a prayer meeting or at church or whatever, and it's 9 o'clock in the morning, and they leave at 4 a.m. And that's not an exaggeration. Like regularly, these kinds of things happen. You're like, whoa, 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 that would blow my schedule up. Yeah, but you wouldn't care. That's the whole point. Like there's story after story of the pastor getting up and doing like five different benedictions because he's trying to send everybody home. And they're like, dude, if you want to leave, go. You know, but God is here. And we're staying. Revival is marked by a renewed love for the Word of God that is the Bible. Why do I say that? I mean, like, why would that inevitably be the case? Because in God's Word, you have the mind of Christ, you have His heart, you have His wisdom. His Word is life. And then. The last one I'll give you, because it goes with what we're talking about today, is that revival is always preceded by, and then it is fueled by prayer. Always. Every time. You find people who have prayed for a decade oftentimes, and then it comes. Sometimes more. You find prayer meetings where people are showing up and like people who are not Christians are showing up because this phenomenon is occurring in their town or in their city or whatever and they're like, I don't know, man, but I'm at least going to go see what's going on here even though I do have Netflix. And just falling to the ground under the power of the Holy Spirit. Guys, revival is preceded by, it is fueled by prayer. That is to say, it happens when we as a people say, you know what, I'm really actually not satisfied with where I'm at personally or corporately, spiritually speaking. God is an infinite God and I'm a finite being, which means there is always more of him that I can have and I actually want more. My appetite is increased. You know what, God, you're not a dog and I'm not going to give you a treat if you roll over and let me scratch your tummy. You're God. And I want you to take me over. And so I'm going to ask you to do what I obviously cannot do, which is bring your presence down upon your people. It's an on your knees. It's an in faith. It's all right, move the mountain. It's over here, Lord. It needs to go here. So Matt talked about the fact that we were coming out of Easter and we're coming as a church out of a 40-day prayer effort at 1109 and we were praying and that was awesome. I loved that. And we're moving in now to this study that we've begun today on prayer. So what's the new prayer challenge? I've had a lot of people asking me that and I want to tell you what it is. It's called Unite 714. It is way bigger than Rio Vista Community Church. There are churches all over the nation, all over the world. Go to the website and you'll see this. And what are we praying for as the body of Christ worldwide through this united effort? We're praying that God will move the mountain of the COVID-19 virus from here to there. And that God will move the mountain of our spiritual virus from here to there. That he will defeat both. And that he will bring revival. And he will visit his people in our day. That's what it's all about. It's based on 2 Chronicles 7.14, which says this, If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. It works like this. 7.14 in the morning and 7.14 in the evening. You go and you get their prayer sheet. It's a one-pager. It comes out every Sunday. So it comes out today. 
You can find it online. You can find it on our app in personal worship. It will come out on Monday morning. There will be a link for it. And you kneel down and you bookend your day by praying for the deliverance of the Lord, by taking two mountains that none of us can move and bringing them to him and saying, okay, God, move it. Move this, move this, and do this for your glory. Visit your people. So what is your mountain personally? And will you bring that to Jesus? And then what about these other two mountains? I mean, we're all captured by the second one and the third too. Will you join us in bringing these to Jesus as well? And do it as those who believe at your core that Jesus is a mountain-moving God. Love you guys. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you, and in doing so, we come to the one for whom not one thing is impossible. Lord, we praise you. We praise you for Jesus, for the one by whom you have loved us and moved the mountain of our sin. God, the one through whom healing of our own personal brokenness comes, the one who gathers up all of the shattered pieces of our lives and and somehow puts us all back together in such a way that we're more beautiful, not less than we were before we were broken. God, we bring our sin to you. We bring our brokenness to you. We bring our failure to you. We bring our past to you. We bring our present to you. We bring our future to you. We ask you to capture us, and we pray that you would humble us. You are not our pet. Lord, forgive us for all the ways that we seek to constrain you, to tie you to a tree, to keep you from coming too close because that might threaten our real gods. Lord, let us repent of our gods and let us know the life of the living Jesus. He is God. And let us learn how to pray from him. Lord, we bring to you our mountains, our impossible things. And you know exactly what they are for every single one of them. You've placed them in our lives for your own strategic purposes. You humble us through them. You teach us through them. Lord, we ask you to move them. Give us faith. Lord, we believe. And help, help our unbelief. For we want to see the mountains move. We pray for this virus, Lord. We ask that you would relieve us, not just us here, but us all over from this virus and from all of its effects. We pray that you would relieve us of the fear that we experience over it. We pray that you would safeguard us from its physical effects. And Lord, we ask for deliverance from the spiritual virus that resides in some measure in all of us. And that calls us to be complacent. That calls us to be content that calls us to a place that we would call comfort and that you would call death. Deliver us, Lord, we ask. Give us your grace, we pray. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Let's, if you want to stand, kneel, sit, uh, whatever posture you want to take as we close in a song, let's go before the Lord in worship. Yeah.
to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed in the scriptures, according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. Go in peace.